Well, we would like to think in Orange County that, um, so, so the State Health Department going on, I want to say two years ago, pushed out naloxone to every county in California. And we have worked hard across the state to get more naloxone out there. So we'd like to think that, yes, that's why overdose death rates are decreasing places. Um, as far as buprenorphine, I absolutely have data on that. And we're going to talk about that shortly. We've got some good, good discussion on that. Yes, yeah, great question. So now let's talk a little bit about um, addiction. Have everybody out there heard about addiction as a chronic disease versus a lifestyle choice? Everybody aware of that? OK, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But first of all, start with a, start with a um, definition. What is addiction? So addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. So I think the key point is that it's a, um, of this is a primary chronic disease. So what are the symptoms of the disease? So there's impairment in behavioral control, craving, diminished recognition of significant, significant problems with behaviors and interpersonal relationships, dysfunctional emotional response, and pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. So um, key point bottom here, pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use. So the first time somebody takes a drug such as, and this isn't just specific to opioids, but a drug, um, we'll say uh, alcohol included, caffeine, so forth. In general, if people will receive, will um, have some sort, sort of it may be euphoria, it may just be a good feeling, they will have a positive response to that. People who continue to use opioids are not on a daily basis using to get that euphoria or that positive feeling. They're using simply to avoid the negative withdrawal symptoms. Anybody out there seen somebody in opioid withdrawal? Couple? Okay. People feel literally feel like they're going to die. So that sympathetic response sweating, nausea, shaking, vomiting, diarrhea, anxiety is so powerful that people will pretty much do anything to get rid of that feeling. So the, the, their daily existence and their daily drug use is no longer about getting that high or the euphoria, it's simply avoiding that. And I think that's a key point for people to understand. And that's a very, very powerful motivator for people. Okay. So addiction, continued use of drugs required to avoid withdrawal, we just talked about that. Increasing dose required, so as you take opioids, you upregulate your receptors and you need more of the drugs simply to feel normal, which is very hard for people. Pretty much their whole existence revolves about where am I going to get my next drug. Poor judgment, I talk about this one a lot when I talk about, um, talk about this in the criminal justice system. So we'll get somebody who comes in and we want them to participate, let's say, in an interactive court process, or let's say it's somebody who is interacting with the like, child welfare services about their kids, and we're expecting these people to be participating in a manner where you and I would participate, and part of the key aspect of their disease process is poor judgment. So until we address that, address their disease process, to expect people to be exhibiting you know, logical thinking and good judgment simply is not going to happen. And the other key point is this is an often fatal disease and it's fatal for young people. Overdose is the number one killer, but there's also suicide. And then there's all of the um, sort of medical complications, infectious like um, hepatitis, HIV, endocarditis, and the list goes on and on. And from a you know, perspective of spending in healthcare, people who are um, addicted to opioids and are untreated cost as much as four times as the average person. Get somebody into treatment, 12 months into treatment, and their healthcare utilization has gone back down to baseline. So it's also cost effective to treat people. Back to the whole, it's a choice, just stop using drugs. It's simply not a very scientifically sound argument to give people. Okay. To understand. There we go. So now we're going to go through this little chart here comparing drug dependence to a chronic disease that I think everybody in the room is familiar with, both hypertension and diabetes. So is there an element of this being heritable? Absolutely in both cases. You can have a genetic predisposition to drug dependence, you can have a genetic predisposition to hypertension and diabetes. Do we fully understand that at this point? No, I'd say we don't for all three disease processes. Is it influenced by behavior? Absolutely, there's elements of choice. You could know going in that you have a very strong family history of alcohol, alcoholism, and you can decide in your life never to take a drink. 
you can have a strong family history of diabetes and you can decide to make sure that your weight is in the optimal range and that you are exercising and living a healthy life. Are there effective treatments? Absolutely. And this is, we're going to spend quite a little bit of time talking about what the treatments are for, available treatments are for opiate use disorder. Does it require adhering to treatment? Yes. If you're being treated for opiate use disorder and you stop taking your medication, you're very likely to relapse. If you stop taking your blood pressure medication, what's likely to happen? Your blood pressure is likely to increase. Um, does it recur? We already talked about that one. And then this bottom one I think is, um, I've had some people have strong reactions to this one. Is this one curable? And I would say in the sense of you will never for the rest of your life have a diagnosis of opiate use disorder or hypertension or diabetes if you are able to you know, get off treatment and make changes, we would still consider you someone who has that. So it's not curable in the sense that it's ever going to go away. Can people get off medication? Absolutely. Thoughts, questions on any of this? There's no wrong reactions to this. Sometimes in some audiences, people have a lot to say about this. Uh huh. So you say curable, um, but that doesn't. It, it is still treatable. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why when we when I put this slide together, curable in the sense that you you could be somebody, and you've probably heard about this terminology spoken about. You could be somebody who has opiate use disorder who was treated and has gotten off of medication and we consider you in recovery and you could be in long-term recovery, I'm talking 20 years of recovery, but you still have opiate use disorder. So yes, very treatable and it doesn't mean people have to be on medication forever, but you, it's a chronic disease, so it's not something that goes away. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's a really interesting discussion and it kind of um, highlights how we talk about um, substance use disorders different than other diseases. So for example, there are lots and lots of conferences about substance use disorder where you will hear, hear people talking about, well, I'm from the school of thought of abstinence base. And you'll have other people say, well, no, I think medication assisted treatment is great. We should go for it. We don't talk about diabetes that way. You don't have an internal medicine conference where you have somebody say, well, I'm in the school of thought that we should use insulin and somebody say, well, no, we should just have everybody lose weight. So we, it, it just highlights that we talk about it differently, but absolutely, there are people who say, even somebody who's getting treated for opiate use disorder and might be on buprenorphine, that they're not truly in recovery because they're taking an opiate replacement. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have the school of thought where somebody says, well, I was on buprenorphine, I got off of it, I no longer have an opiate use disorder. But the but the reason I say not curable is because it's a chronic disease. So is there a risk of relapse in the future? Yes. And to the individual patient, when you're talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, I would never say to somebody, you'll never be cured of this disease. I absolutely tell everybody who I would treat that if, if medication is something you want to do now, then try it. And yes, most people can get off of medication across the board. Does that make sense? So there are, um, for example, and I always use this example because I can include myself, those of us with blue eyes, we have a statistically significant increased risk of being diagnosed with alcoholism over a course of a lifetime. Is it because of blue eyes? Absolutely not. There's some other genetic thing that we don't understand. So there's, there's those sort of genetic, you know, is it a, pers uh, a particular loci, is it gene expression? We don't have it down to that level yet, but there's that component, and then we also see the multi-generational. Now the problem with those studies are separating out the um, component of is it because they're genetically doing something? Is it epigenetics because of exposure prenatally? Or is it a learned behavior because they're watching it in the household? So they both take place. Yes, but we don't have it down to the level of being able to, like, of course, do like a genetic panel and say, you are going to do this. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting question. I think that, in general, the biggest factor for... Um, relapse when we're talking about opiate use disorder is stopping medication assisted treatment to tell you the truth if somebody was on it in the first place so the studies show us time and time again that people do well when they're in the treatment program and I would guess that there are regional differences there's still places where um, the, the duration of treatment for specific drugs in different states, different counties are limited. So then there's patients who you've met your time limit, you have to get off of your buprenorphine. So that would be a key one that might be different in different places in the, in the country. And then um, 
there certainly are social factors and stressors in life that can lead people to, to relapse. Does that make sense? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about big picture public health approach and what we are trying to do to address the opiate epidemic. So number one, safe prescribing practices, and I, I already kind of briefly covered it. That's getting pushed out from federal level, that's getting pushed out um, state level, local level, medical boards, and overall we are across the country decreasing prescribing. Big caveat to that, however, is we have a cohort of people that are addicted to opioids. So the question is, are we meeting that, getting those people into treatment? So that's the next one, is increasing access to medication-assisted treatment. Once again, big push at the federal, state, and local level as far as grants on how to increase medication-assisted treatment. Um, this is the single most important strategy to reduce death when you're talking about that group of people who have opiate use disorder, is getting them access to medication-assisted treatment. Um, increasing naloxone. So uh, as kind of as you asked earlier, um, there's been a big push to get naloxone out. There's been a push for naloxone co-prescribing for anybody who's on an opiate. Um, that, that sort of fits into the harm reduction strategy. And one thing I point out, that is an absolute critical focus because we have people, and once again with fentanyl, it can be their first time taking fentanyl and they very well might not even know they're getting fentanyl. They could have bought what they think is a Xanax tablet on the street and in fact it's fentanyl. So the more naloxone out there, the better. But that's as far from primary prevention as we can get, right? That's redu reducing, I mean reversing a death that has already happened. So primary prevention, which in public health we always want to do, is a big, big area of struggle right now. So. Um, there, there's federal money, there's behavioral health money that goes towards primary prevention, so education in schools and so forth, but I think we as a society really need to focus on primary prevention. Why do we have this population of people that is so susceptible to addiction? And it isn't just opiate addiction, it's alcohol, it's meth, it's cocaine, all of that. And I think, um, anybody want to throw out an idea out there as to why? I think this is a bit, there's no wrong answers and I don't have the right answer, otherwise we would have already spread this across the whole country. But any thoughts on that? I can tell you what we kind of are thinking as far as public health. Um, some of this stems from issues such as social isolation, <coughs> lack of housing, lack of gainful employment. So these are big, big picture societal things that all play into this. Um, other component of this is we treat, so we've been talking a lot about overdose reversals with naloxone, we've been talking about in general the medications that we have for treating opiate use disorder. You have to fit a certain criteria to even qualify for taking something like methadone or buprenorphine, and we treat this as an end-stage disease. So we talk about, on the state dashboard, we talk about reducing opioid deaths. That is like saying your measures for diabetic control, instead of focusing on an A1C, we're focusing on, you know, we have had 5% less limb amputations, right? So we're focusing on the very, very downstream end-stage disease, whereas I think as a society we need to look way more upstream. Once again, I don't have the solution to this, but that's something big picture that we're looking at get into some of the treatments for opiate use disorder. This is a big, complicated chart. I'm going to highlight some of this. So in general, when we talk about medication-assisted treatment, I'm going to focus on the ones that uh, we use for opiate use disorder. There's other ones used for alcohol and so forth. So there's methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone are the main ones. I'm just going to, I'm going to highlight a couple things and we'll go through each one. So um, let's start with naltrexone. Everybody in the room heard of naltrexone or Vivitrol? Yes, no, okay, okay. So um, naltrexone is an antagonist at the opioid receptors in the body. So it completely blocks any opioid. So um, big key one about this, no potential for misuse. And this is widely used in like the criminal justice system for opiate use disorder, likely because of that no potential for misuse, which means there isn't any diversion of it because there's no real value to it. People aren't going to ever want this to tell you the truth. It's not something that has any val street value. So a couple of key caveats with this, however. So if you put someone on naltrexone, so naltrexone can be taken orally daily or it can be given in a month-long depot shot, which is called Vivitrol. If you take it, 
because of the opiate blocker component. So let's say you give this to someone who has a long history of IV heroin use and their receptors have upregulated to a certain point. You give them Vivitrol, they're on it for several months. They're going to downregulate receptors back to baseline. Okay? We see this frequently, not frequently, let's say this is one of the problems with this. When people go back to use, if they do go back to using opioids, they, if they go back to using the amount they were using prior, overdose is a very real complication to this. Other component of this, it has pretty poor patient compliance for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's not doing anything to treat the withdrawal symptoms. So you're putting a blocker in there and it treats none of that physiologic response or any of those withdrawal symptoms. This works really well for highly motivated individuals. So people who have professional degrees, let's say they get in trouble with their licensing board and they're very highly motivated to um, adhere to a treatment plan. The added idea in people's minds that if I do use an opioid, I won't feel any of the euphoric effects of it can be a big boost for some people. Okay, questions on naltrexone? It wants it, yeah, go ahead. Can, can it be combined with some other drugs to treat the withdrawal effects, or is it given just by itself? So, like acutely, yes. So one thing about naltrexone is it's not given in, in the immediate time frame of use. So you have to be like seven days off of any opioid. So in general, when people have started naltrexone, they're already past that acute withdrawal symptom. But there's other things like clonidine and so forth that can be given to people to help with the withdrawal symptoms before they're started on naltrexone. All right, now let's talk about methadone. So methadone is a full agonist of the new opioid receptor, which means it acts the same way as a hydrocodone, an oxycontin, a heroin. It, is, um, it does have a potential for misuse because it's an opioid. Um, and methadone for opiate use disorder can only be prescribed at an opiate treatment program. Now the opiate treatment programs are highly, highly regulated at the federal level and um, if any of you have ever learned about an opiate treatment program, for the vast majority of people who go there, it requires daily dosing. So people go between the hours of like 5 and 9 a.m. or 5 or 10 a.m. and they get their daily dose. It's observed by a dosing nurse and or employee of the methadone clinic. And in general, methadone, because it's a long-acting opioid, it gives sort of a baseline uniform um, uh, it, it, the goal is this. The goal is to not have people getting any sort of euphoria or high from it, and it just gives them a baseline steady dose throughout the day. Some people who have been compliant with therapy will get take-home. So some people will have a week's worth of take-home, sometimes more, but for the vast majority of people, it requires daily dosing. So when we go back to talking about people who have opiate use disorder and we wanting to get them stable in treatment so they can go back to living their life as normal people to have to have them have to go to a methadone clinic every day for a lot of people is not feasible for example in orange county we have four methadone clinics in all of the county and they're all in the north part of the county so anybody in south county is having to drive upwards of 45 minutes a day to get dosing which just is not very feasible um, very, very good option for people who have um, failed other therapies. For some people, that daily check-in with either someone having eyes on them, saying how's it going and so forth, is very useful. For some people, that is a necessity. So methadone plays a key role. Questions on methadone? All right, buprenorphine. So um, all of you familiar with buprenorphine? By name, Suboxone, how it's best known? Okay. So <clears throat> buprenorphine is unique. It's a partial mu agonist and a kappa antagonist. Couple of critical points to make about buprenorphine. Um, number one, because of its unique properties, there is a ceiling effect. So people taking past 24 milligrams or so do not get any added effect of it. So for a patient population that has been abusing drugs, hence they're being treated for opiate use disorder, that is a useful characteristic of the drugs, unlike a methadone, where people could take more and more and more. And a key point about methadone, people who are on methadone can use things like heroin on top of it and still feel a euphoric effect. Whereas with buprenorphine, buprenorphine has a very, very high affinity for the receptor. <coughs> Excuse me. So high, in fact, that if you give buprenorphine when somebody has recently taken something like heroin, it'll put them into what's called precipitated withdrawal. So they'll kick all the heroin off the receptors and those people will be in withdrawal. Because of that 
component of it, it helps with the whole treatment of um, that sort of addictive behavior because people cannot, without feeling really bad, use other medications while taking buprenorphine. It also has a sort of a ceiling effect on the respiratory depression. In general, um, the only times we've seen overdoses with buprenorphine is when it's mixed with another substances, and that, that, that usually is a benzodiazepine. So benzos mixed with opioids is a deadly combo that's used all the time. And um, um, buprenorphine, taken, it's taken sublingually or, or buccally, it um, by itself is not likely in an adult to cause an overdose, so it's a safer medication. Um, does treat in the same way methadone does the craving and withdrawal symptoms of it and it's available as of this year in a depot form which is a once once monthly dosing which for um, specific populations is a very attractive dosing form and we're going to talk a little bit more about it here so back to your question about overdoses and what happens when you introduce buprenorphine so the France story is sort of a case model for that so France recognized that they had a problem and did something about it much earlier than we did here. And what France did is they said, okay, all primary care providers in France, you're going to prescribe buprenorphine. And here's what they saw. So they pushed buprenorphine out, which is what you're seeing right here. And that their overdoses, which is what you're seeing on the top right here, vastly went down. So that is a very clear push buprenorphine out to the population and your overdose deaths are going to decrease. Now France, when they push this out to primary care, we in this country are very, very, and I'm not saying this is wrong, very concerned about diversion. So a big part of how we regulate um, buprenorphine is all about tracking it so that it's not diverted, it's not out on the street. France didn't really, I'm not going to say they didn't care about that, but France had less concern about that than treating the overdose deaths, deaths and this is what they saw, so very effective. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Questions on this? Yeah. Do you know why like we don't do that thing? <laughs> That's a good question. I think there's a lot of people that from a harm reduction strategy would say push it out this way. Yes, it's safer. It, it, it is an interesting, um, when I was in private practice, the vast majority of people who had come into my practice and would want buprenorphine had already started it by themselves on the street. So the fact, we know that it's out there, it's being diverted, is that right? Absolutely not. We want patients to take their medication as prescribed for themselves. We know it is diverted, for sure. Um, and, and we don't want people making a profit of it, and we want that sort of controlled. But, um, but there is a sort of public health harm reduction argument for that not being as big of an issue as, yeah. So it does have the potential of um, addiction, and is that why it's being converted? Or okay, so, so yeah, so the, the question is, so does it have the potential for addiction? Any opioid, methadone, buprenorphine included, if you take that, you will develop a physiologic um, dependence on it. So when you stop buprenorphine, you stop methadone, even if you're taking it as your doctor prescribes, you will have withdrawal symptoms. It can be titrated down so that you're avoiding that. And the addiction component goes back to the pathologically, you know, searching for reward by use of substance. When somebody's stable in treatment on either of these, we wouldn't say they're addicted to it, right? Because that brings in the behavioral component. But yes, people who have never, anybody in the room who's never taken buprenorphine, if you took that, you would feel a euphoric effect of the opioid. It's less so than something like heroin, but yes, it does have that. Yeah. yeah. You know, learning from my patients, the other use of buprenorphine, it's a longer acting opioid. Um, people, if they're not able to get their drug of choice, so let's say that used to be heroin, there's people that will bridge between their doses with buprenorphine because it's longer acting. So to avoid that withdrawal symptom, they'll do it. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Yeah. So can it be monitored like the other than methadone? Can it be like administered through a clinic or a like yes, yes, we were just going to talk about that next. Thanks for asking, that's perfect. So yes, buprenorphine, the, the, the positive part about buprenorphine, we'll talk about that when we go to this one right here. Um, so back in 2000, when buprenorphine was going to be allowed to be used by physicians for treatment of opiate use disorder, there's a federal um, 
a whole bunch of regulations placed on it. Number one, it can be prescribed by primary care doctors in, outside of an opiate treatment program, but the doctors have to, and now mid-levels, have to go through in, um, uh, additional training. So it's an eight-hour training, and you get waivered to prescribe buprenorphine. And um, that's pretty much the main requirement. However, the opiate treatment programs can also prescribe and or dispense it. So there are some methadone clinics that will do daily dispensing of the buprenorphine. Okay, that makes sense? Okay, let me, while we're on the topic, let me just talk about that a little bit. So it's one of, and it may be the only medication out there where doctors are limited on the amount of patients they can treat. So when a doctor gets an X waiver for the first year, they can only treat 30 patients. Second year is 100 patients. You can apply after, and I'm getting the time frame wrong, at a subsequent time after that, you can apply for an increase up to 275, and that's relatively new. So there was a lot of pushback from physicians in this community treating about why that is. So physicians and mid-levels can prescribe any amount they want of opioids, but we're limited to treating only a certain number of patients. But that, once again, is a federal law, and they've lessened, loosened that a little bit, but yes, it requires, that's a, sort of a barrier to getting people to prescribe. Okay, let's talk about buprenorphine prescriptions in the two counties right here. So top graph is showing buprenorphine prescribing in Orange County since 2015. And contrary to what should be happening, not only has there been a 0% increase since 2015, you can see by the graph that it's been decreasing, okay? LA County looks a little better. 4% increase in prescribing since 2015. Is it enough? Absolutely not. So we're simply not meeting the the treatment demands right now. And, and, and this is not unique to Southern California. This is sort of across the country. Um, pregnancy, I want to talk about, I want to talk about some of the barriers as to why in just a moment. So just kind of keep this in mind for a minute. Questions on this? Okay. Um, pregnancy, I want to throw in there, it's kind of uh, not fit in with the rest, but very important to cover. We're seeing across the country increase in neonatal abstinence syndrome. So neonatal abstinence syndrome results when a mom has taken an opioid, doesn't matter if it's legally prescribed from doctor for some legitimate reason or taken on the street. Babies can be born physiologically dependent because they've been exposed in utero. This is a, it's increasing because we have more women of childbearing age on opioids than ever before. And it's associated with a lot of harm toward the baby and healthcare costs. So often these babies in this country, we often put these babies in a NICU and we watch them and, um, and it, this is treatable. This is treatable. There's pretty good protocols for, you know, weaning the babies off and getting them back. However, we all know how important that initial bonding is with mom. And so this is a barrier to breastfeeding. This is a barrier to that initial bonding. So this is a huge issue. This should get better when we treat moms better. But this is just something to be aware of. It's a big issue. Um, one thing, we do see differences in uh, sort of the um, severity and occurrence of neonatal abstinence syndrome depending on what medications moms are using. So if moms are maintained on medication-assisted treatment during pregnancy, buprenorphine versus methadone in general, and this is, this is not always, in general the, the moms who are on buprenorphine, their babies have less severe neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, breastfeeding questions. This comes up all the time. Um, can moms breastfeed if they're on medication-assisted treatment? Is it okay for them to breastfeed on methadone, on buprenorphine? And you're going to get opinions across the board on this. In general, it's felt to be safe when mom is adhering to a uh, set medication-assisted treatment. If mom is out there using who knows what on the street, then no, we would not recommend breastfeeding. But in general, if mom is safely or in a, a stable treatment program, yes, she can breastfeed. Questions on that? Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about Okay. Um, duration of treatment. This comes up all the time. Question, how long do people need to be on this? So yes, we recognize that medication is just a treatment, can help get people stabilized so they can focus on other aspects of their life, but how long do they have to be on it? And the, 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 the simple answer is it depends on the patient, and that's kind of what we see with every you know, medication. It depends on how the patient is doing. Um, once again, I like to 
compare this with hypertension. Do both require long, lifelong treatment? In some cases, absolutely. Increase in mortality and morbidity if you stop the medications? Yes, in both cases. Opioid addiction, the number one being overdose. Okay, and we often will see, even on um, buprenorphine, people stopping treatment and overdosing. They go back to using the same dose they were using before and people overdose. Um, can you discontinue treatment in highly motivated people with lifestyle changes? Absolutely. So we're not saying everybody has to be on medication, but as I mentioned before, we still see across the country these arbitrary, um, uh, you know, treatment duration. Patients can be on it for six months, you can apply for two extensions, right? That makes no sense based on our data. In general, what we've shown is the longer people stay in treatment, the, long, the better they do. Okay, now let's talk about what are the barriers? Why are we not seeing an increase in buprenorphine prescribing? Number one across the board is stigma. It is still the idea that substance use disorders are somehow different than other disease processes and people can choose to stop using and that's that. And this is across the board. You get it even from um, some of the abstinence-based schools of thought around treatment and you get it at the county level, you get it at the individual level, you get it at the physician level, you get it at the family level for these people and you get it for the individuals. There's lots of individuals that just say, I should be able to stop this without medication. Um, we kind of talked about this, the, the waiver requires eight hours of training. That is a barrier for people. Okay, even that amount of training, it's in general, in medical, when you, when you go to medical school, you go to residency, you do your training, you come out of residency, and there, there's new medications that you'll have to learn about, new things that come out, but to learn a whole new class of something is hard for people. It's just another thing to add on. Um, Limits on the number of patients treated, we talked about that as well. The waiver only lets you prescribe a certain amount. And I'm going to share at this point just my pathway and because I, I could ex kind of sympathize with a lot of the physicians not wanting to do this. So I came out of residency and went into practice um, in San Diego to an FQHC and I'd have patients that would come in and say, I used to go to the methadone clinic, I want to come here for Suboxone. And did I know what Suboxone is? Yes, I had some you know, basic understanding of it. The only time I had used buprenorphine in medical school was when I worked at a sheep animal lab. That's what uses our painkiller for the animals we were doing some studies on. Okay, that was it, that was my experience. I did not, in medical school, I probably had a half an hour class talking about addiction and its treatment with opiate treatment programs. Not something I had exposure to. I. Um, have a mom who's a neurologist who early on was asked by one of her, in, saw, in neurology saw a lot of chronic pain, back pain, headaches, surgeries for back that resulted in nerve pain, just on and on. So she was very comfortable with pain management and had a, um, a physician, uh, it was actually another physician, a fellow physician who was a patient of hers, when the um, federal government said you can prescribe buprenorphine, for opiate addiction, this patient came to my mom and said, you should get wavered and start seeing patients. And my mom's initial reaction is, I'm not gonna do that. I'm fine with what I'm doing in my practice. Well, she did, and she started prescribing very, very early on. So she had a full addiction medicine practice. I ended up um, coming back and joining her practice, doing some of the primary care and some other stuff, and started, she uh, literally sat me down, had registered me for the course and said, you're gonna do this right now. And I was like, come on, I don't have time for this. Like, it's not, I don't need another thing. I did it, slowly started seeing patients. About a year after she um, had talked me into joining her practice, she retired, which I think was her motive the whole time of getting me there. But I inherited an entire addiction medicine practice. By then I had been, I had been seeing patients um, with opioid use disorder for a year, so I was comfortable with it but decided if I'm gonna be doing this, and she had a full practice, and I'm not just talking about opioid use disorder, alcohol, stimulants, we had, a, we had a lot of patients. I need to go back and get training. So I did the practice pathway and did my addiction boards, and then from there have been doing this for years now. But I fully sympathize with physicians when they say, I don't need to add an additional thing, I don't have training in this, I'm not comfortable with this. I understand that because I was there. But then um, having done it, I can share with them there's an absolute need for it and they will be very rewarding patients once you actually start seeing them because the bottom line is they're already your patients. These are not different people. These are the patients you're already seeing for all the other disorders. 
but these are some of the reasons why we're seeing the deaths we're seeing in the ER visits, because we simply are not meeting the treatment need. Questions on that? 